Eric, Chapter One. Tell me the story again, Mama Dove. Of course, Shaddy. Come, sit on my lap. That is how my earliest memory begins. I remember being held securely by the arms of my mama adoptive, my foster mother. She was the kindest person I had ever met. In six short years, I had already learned that everyone but her would treat me with revulsion and disgust. My dear mama dog suffered the curse of blindness, although it sometimes seemed she could somehow see misbehavior from across a darkened room. But it allowed her to overlook my hideous face and give me the love my young spirit craved. In the memory, she held me tightly and told me the story of my birth. I remember thinking that she was coughing a lot more than usual. It would be a sad omen for the upcoming weeks. Well, Liebling, your mother and father decided that it was time to have a child. So your mother kept you safe for nine months, and then it was time to bring you into the world to meet your father. But when she brought you out, your face looked like it does today. Your mother was sad because it meant that she hadn't kept you as safe as she thought she had. She was so sad that she decided she would rather live with God than here with you and your father. Before she went away, she named you Eric, after her brother. Then your father found me to be your new mother so that you were well cared for. It seemed even with the mask they put over your face. He didn't want to be your father anymore. Why not? I remember feeling my whole body slump as she told this part of the story. Never mind. The good part is that your father left you with myself and Papa Dop, and both of us love you just as much as we would any child. I snuggled deeper into her arms. The memory ends there. Of course she didn't want to tell a six-year-old that his father abandoned his own flesh and blood rather than look at the face that held only one association, the suicide of his beloved wife. It took me many years to figure that out. She also didn't bother telling me that my fully sighted foster father loathed me as much as anyone else did. I don't know whether I knew that at that point in my life, but it became completely apparent very shortly after. I remember standing in the cemetery on a cloudy morning, watching them lower Mama Dop's simple coffin into a hole in the ground. My head was throbbing from where I had been struck. I had wept during the funeral, sitting in the front pew with my foster father and my foster siblings. My foster father had turned to me and backhanded me to get me to stop crying. He himself had been dry-eyed throughout the service. As we all gathered by the grave, I clutched in my hand an offering. I had overheard my foster siblings talking about what kind of flower they were going to bring to leave on her grave, and where in the village they would go to pick or steal such a bloom. I wanted to do likewise, but I knew that picked flowers withered just a day or so after they were picked. I had found a length of wire in the workshop and twisted it into the shape of a flower. I took special care to give the petals a point at the end to approximate a lily. It was this wire sculpture that I clutched in my small hand. My foster siblings each stepped forward and cast an already wilting bloom onto the coffin. I followed suit and dropped my wire offering onto the angles of its lid. The priest looked closer at me with momentary interest, but then the moment passed, and the dirt began to fall into the hole from the shovels of the gravediggers. I remember standing at the unglazed window of the family's little house and watching the other children traipse off to school one fine morning. My new foster mother, a shrewish woman my foster father had married with indecent haste, and I had gone one morning to enroll me in the school. The schoolmaster had taken one look at my mask and told her, I don't teach freaks. Take them home and put them to work. The memory of this rejection stung deeper than the momentary horror of casual acquaintances in the street. Without schooling, I could not make anything of myself but a common laborer at best. At worst, I might be reduced to begging for scraps in the street for my entire life. It was a dispiriting thought to a child of seven. I did extra chores for my foster siblings in exchange for them teaching me what they learned each day, but this was highly unsatisfying. 
Often, I'd fire questions at them in an attempt to expand my under-stimulated mind, and I would be met with blank stares, or, I don't know, or, the teacher never talked about that. It was as if the other children were content to know exactly what was presented to them and nothing more. Their apathy was incomprehensible to me. They, in turn, seemed to have no inkling of the speed with which my thoughts darted from one thing to another, and the way in which my attention rested briefly on things and puzzled out the ways their components fit together. Let me illustrate for you the way my mind works. I remember the day Papa Dot brought home the music box. He would very seldomly bring gifts for his wife, never for the children. And this was the most recent one. I watched him wind the mechanism and listen to the tinkling melody that issued forth. Half of my mind began to whir and try to figure out how the sounds were produced inside such a little box. The other half of my mind listened to each note and puzzled out how they were related to one another and tried to predict what notes might play next. This left none of my mind occupied with self-preservation, and I incautiously reached out a hand to pick up the little box. The blow from my foster father was quick but stinging, and I retreated across the room in pain. I think that was the first time that I realized that I hated the man. My foster stepmother watched me go with irritation, irked that I had spoiled the loving occasion between her and her husband. I turned the right side of my face toward the happy gathering across the room, hoping that my mask would hide my sulky expression from my foster family. My name is Eric. I have never found out who my birth parents were, so I do not know what my family name might truly be. In various stages of my life, I have called myself Eric Dessler, Eric Lemit, and Eric LeBlanc, among others. For a long period of my life, it suited me to be called simply Le Fantôme. Often, I had no need to introduce myself, as I found myself far from all other humans, or amongst people who didn't care what my name was. I have been enjoined by my son Gustav to write down the story of my life. I have laid out above the scant few memories I have before the age of seven, but after that point my memory is more consistent. I will henceforth be telling my story as it happened to me directly in the moment. The banging on the wall beside my rude pallet came as it always did, a mere ten minutes after the rooster on the neighbor's farm crowed to announce the sunrise. My foster father was an alcoholic to a greater or lesser extent for my whole life, but he never lost the ability to roll out of bed and make it to work on time. He was a carpenter and jack-of-all-trades to our little village. He spent his days fixing things and making improvements, for which he never charged quite enough. His wife nagged at him constantly to charge more for his work, but he preferred to cultivate his wide circle of drinking buddies rather than drive them away with fair prices for his work. I remembered the argument they had had last night when he had brought home only a few sous instead of the many francs she anticipated. I sighed and coaxed my young limbs from the nest of warmth under the ragged blanket. I knew from harsh experience that delay would bring only blows and abuse. I reached automatically for my mask and groaned as I looked at it. One of my foster siblings, impossible to say which this time, had stomped on it, flattening the curves I kept trying to mold into it. It was made of leather, stretched over a wire frame that was intended to fit closely to my face. A footprint marred the bridge of the nose and the expanse that covered the ruin of my right cheek. I painstakingly bent the wire back into an approximation of its original shape, but there was nothing I could do about the footprint on the pale leather. I cast a quick look over to the corner of the room where the components for my latest project lay. Though my mind instantly heeded their siren call and started puzzling out a new way to fit them together, this was a conundrum that had occupied me for three days now. I dragged myself away from temptation and hurried to the kitchen to make breakfast. The oats in the sack were critically low, and I measured carefully so that there would at least be enough for my foster father and siblings to eat over the next few days. Having rationed the oats carefully, I added water and began to prepare the morning porridge. At the table, my foster father sat with his eyes still closed, waiting to be served his breakfast. I either got lucky or I mismeasured. 
There was just enough porridge in the pot after I dished out the portions for him, my foster stepmother, and my foster siblings that I was able to taste a few spoonfuls of the food. There was no cream or sugar for it in this household, so I was used to it just the way it was. My foster brother, Gilbert, watched each spoonful as I lifted it to my mouth, clearly resentful that I was taking food he could have had. His eyes walked onto my vandalized mask, and he smirked as he surveyed the damage. I turned aside and ignored him. I cut a thin slice from the loaf of bread to augment my breakfast. We must buy more oats next time we go to market, Papa Up, I reminded him. I saw his cheeks flush and his eyes narrow as he heard the silly childish nickname. I knew that it got under his skin, which is why I used it often. It was one of the very few ways I could defend myself against his abuse. He cast a sheepish glance at his wife, clearly afraid that she would inquire as to whether he had sufficient funds to purchase the food. It was obvious to everyone in the room that he did not. I cleared everything away from breakfast and hurried to get my jacket before leaving. I was unofficially apprenticed to my foster father. What this meant in practice was that I was the extension of his lazy body while he, quote, worked. If something needed to be fetched, it fell to me. If something needed to be worked on inside a tight space, it fell to me. If a problem required too much mental energy to solve, he shoved it in my direction, banking on the fact that my mind could never resist a challenge. The only task he reserved for himself was interacting with the client and taking credit and payment for my ingenuous fixes. Today, we were working on the other side of the village. I thanked my lucky stars that I had had a fraction of a hot breakfast as the chill wind tried to attack me through my threadbare jacket. As we walked, I pestered my foster father with questions. I remembered Mambadop's simplified story of my birth, as outlined above, but I was getting older and more questions about my birth were coming to me every day. I scampered around him like a puppy, throwing questions at him, though with no real hope that he might answer one. What's my father's name? Is he rich? Does his face look like mine does? Am I going to go live with him one day? My foster father only shook his head warily as he listened to the familiar litany of my questions. He stopped and turned to face me, holding a hand to his aching head. He pushed his hangover away long enough to tell me, Look, you little... Eric, I mean. Your father? doesn't want you. That's why he gave you to us. There's nothing you or I can do to change that. So for the love of God, stop pestering me about it. You would do well to remember that we keep you as part of this family out of the goodness of our hearts, and a little gratitude is in order. Now move. We're late. And he shoved me onward to our day's task. I stumbled a bit, but caught up to him. I trotted along behind him with my eyes down and my face flaming red. Today, we were scheduled to work inside the house of one of the rich folks. The gentleman had large two-story windows in his house, and it was up to us to figure out how to hang draperies from a spot neither of us could reach. Our ladder was only high enough to get us halfway up the window. But I had a plan in mind. I explained my idea to my foster father, and he agreed, happy to have a solution. He sent me to another handyman in town to borrow a second ladder. By the time I got back to our worksite with it, he had already set up the first ladder and moved a large credenza from the house's furnishings into position. I selected a flat piece of lumber to bridge the two tall items. Then I carefully positioned the second ladder atop the lumber. My foster father eyed the arrangement dubiously. It looks solid enough, but I'm sure as hell not going up there. Rolling my eyes to myself, I carefully ascended the makeshift scaffolding. It held under my scrawny weight, and I was able to make the final installations. After the draperies were installed, I began to disassemble my scaffolding, listening all the while to my foster father, talking obsequiously to the house's majordomo, taking credit for my ingenuity and industry. By the time our things were stacked by the back door ready to be carried home, he had made a new friend and garnered an invitation to join the staff's poker night. I tapped my foot impatiently, eager to be home where I could spend a few minutes with my personal project before dinner. My stomach rumbled hollowly in anticipation of the nightly stew waiting for us, even though my portion was probably going to be thin and meatless. 
He pretended to ignore me and took his own sweet time making his farewells to his new friend. When I got home, I went directly to my bed to plot myself in front of my project. I had seen in the home of one of our clients a magnificent wooden model of a clock that works just like any clock of brass. I had looked it over for as long as I dared, and I thought I had memorized all the components and gears that made it work. I had come straight home and begun carving the pieces I needed from offcuts of lumber. I now had them all carved and sanded smooth in front of me, but I still cannot make them work together to create the clock mechanism. I sat down and worked quickly to make the most of the fading light in my corner. I got two pieces together and prepared to affix them together with a screw. I looked around, searching for my screwdriver. I was soon resigned to the fact that it was not there. That could only mean that she had it. Lucille, where is my screwdriver? My foster sister answered disdainfully. It's not my job to keep track of your toys, you tiresome monkey. Are you so stupid beneath that twisted horror show you call a face that you can't even keep track of the things you need? I looked once more at the configuration of pieces clutched in my hand. I set it carefully on the floor, memorizing their arrangement as I did so. I rose wearily from my place to go confront her and demand the tool back. I knew she had it. She had had it the last dozen times it had mysteriously disappeared. It was a special tool that fit my left-handed grip more comfortably than any I could have borrowed from my foster father's toolbox. She held it in her hand and mocked me when I tried to take it back from her. I felt red anger come over me even though I'd been mistreated in this fashion more times than I could count. I rushed at her and pushed her to the floor with the sheer speed of my attack. She screamed as she hit the floor and I fell on top of her, grabbing for the hand that held the screwdriver. I got my hands on it and ripped it out of her grasp, but before I could scurry away, my foster stepmother's hands grabbed my collar and pulled me to my feet. I endured her tirade of angry words. She was angry that I dared to strike my foster siblings and disturb the peace of her home, no matter what injustices I had suffered. It was a familiar refrain with her, and I'm afraid my expression must have betrayed my indifference to her complaint. She ended her tirade with a decree that I was to be deprived of supper and sent to bed. I slumped off to my bed, resentful beyond bearing of the injustice, and thanking heaven that I had at least had those few mouthfuls at breakfast. When I got back to my corner, I saw that my careful arrangement of pieces had been kicked apart, destroying one of the wooden gear wheels in the process. This could only have been Gilbert's doing. I dropped onto the bed and lay there, staring at the ceiling as twilight fell, counting all the ways I hated my life in this house. I wondered again, as I often did, what my life would have been like in my real father's house. It couldn't be worse than this, could it? My dreams that night were populated with people who insisted on irritating me and provoking my anger. And a shadowy figure who held out his hand to me from a brilliantly lit doorway.